Father, be with us this morning, please. Come alongside us. Help us keep attention, keep us focused. But may our hearts be upon you and not upon us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the sunshine. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. What a glorious day our Lord has made. Amen. 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 No, no. Steve, you're so right. But <laughs> when you have a lot of rain, it's nice to see the sunshine. But I notice how clean everything is. It's kind of watchful well that stuff right into the ocean, right? But, um, thank you, Lord, for the rain, and thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for everything that you give us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand, please? We're going to sing his praise, <laughs> sing the famous one.
John. <laughs> Don't bogart his highs. <laughs> Imagine every person you see singing you, living your life like a love song. Can you imagine that? And then they see Christ in you. Can you imagine that? Let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you for giving us life. And thank you for uh, the love song of, of eternity. And thank you for the ultimate gift that you say. The ultimate gift that you say is not just death, but our life. Thank you, Father. <coughs> Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is a psalm of David. When he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out, David went away. Abimelech is a term um, for king, as in like uh, in Egypt, they call the pharaohs. Pharaohs are kings. And uh, that's, that's what we refer to as Abimelech, uh, the Philistine king. Now, Philistine, what David did when he said he changed his behavior, David just hadn't verified that, uh, that his psalm was trying to kill him. So he's running, he's running to a place called Gath, he's going through the wilderness, and he's going to a Philistine king. Imagine the worst boss you ever had. <laughs> Only they had the power to kill you. Yeah, if they didn't like the way you breathed or looked or how your hair was done, I'd have been cooked. But David runs to these, runs to the Philistine king and and realizes he made a big mistake. So what does he do? He acts absolutely bananas. He goes out of his mind acting crazy, as we all have done at times, but David was doing it to save his own skin. So it wasn't his most noble time. It wasn't the most noble season for David. And it certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't a season to write home about. There's nothing to really be proud of, if that sounds familiar to any of you. You've gone through a season like that. And yet... And yet, during this time, that's when he penned Psalm 34, which is a psalm of praise and worship to God, talking about praising God not just during the ugly times, but for the ugly times in his life. And that's humility. That demonstrates humility. And if you're asking me, humility and gratefulness are the two keys of foundation for this, for what we're about to experience right now in about two and a half minutes. And Psalm 34 talks about joy. David feeling and expressing pure joy, even during a time of insanity. Even, it doesn't matter what the season is. David is turning whatever's going on into joy with God. When's the last time you experienced joy? When is the last time you experienced even laughter? The last time you experienced joy, the correct answer is the last three songs you said in this amazing worship. That's the correct answer. So that's sheer joy. If you don't have an exact moment, I'll set the stage for you. Think about this. Everybody loves, everyone knows and loves Daryl. Right? Yeah. Uh, all right. Which one? And that's driving me nuts because it's home spirit. Everything about Daryl is connected to the Holy Spirit. But I'm here to tell you that he doesn't hold a candle to Jen, his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would drive her nuts right now? We all turn around and just look at her and saw her smile. <laughs> because that smile that you see right there is exactly the sheer joy that she experiences when she's working with her children. Phoenix Snow and Aurora Rain. More importantly, or more poignantly, Phoenix Snow, her oldest. She gets to teach her at home. So they got this little section picked out their house. And they live on the side of a mountain, and there's this little room where Phoenix gets to go in, and, and, and Mom Jane and Happy Jane gets to go and teach her. They got everything set up. The pictures of the mountain, they got the mountain right outside. If they want to go outside and go for a walk, they can. But she's watching her daughter learn, and she's learning very rapidly. Imagine the amount of talent that you see that God has given him and Jen according to the intelligence of their child, right? The offspring is definitely going stronger and beginning their takeover of the months in household. <laughs> this child is so happy, and Jane gets to watch her be happy, and then she gets to see Aurora. Aurora Raymond, the, the little bobblehead, the littlest one, come in and go, I want to learn. I want to learn with my sister. I want to be here. But there's no spot for her. It's just the one desk that's set up for, for Phoenix to learn. But then Aurora comes in, I want to learn. And so Phoenix says, well, I want my sister to learn. And, so and Jane gets to watch this. She gets to watch the kids learn, absorb, understand, but be together. See, she's including her. There's no spot, but there is a spot for you. There's always a spot. There's always a spot for inclusion. Sheer joy. David goes in front of these people, in front of this king, to, to get himself out of hot water, realizes he's in more hot water, and has to have a mental breakdown. Now, kids, I don't know. I don't have kids. I don't have a plan. I don't have pets. I, don't, I have sandwiches. That makes me happy. But I, I don't have kids, so I can't, I don't know this. But kids have meltdowns. I don't have kids, but I've been to a mall. <laughs> See, y'all just kind of let it happen, and then you just watch the parents, like, look at their children. There's this look, like they're looking at the child. 
kind of like, this human came from, is this even a human? <laughs> just kind of like, it's like a pod person. They just have their mind like, just let it happen. Let's let that, that happen. But even in that, even in those moments, you're looking at your child. I can't even imagine the, the sheer joy you have in that, even when you kind of want to strangle and hug them at the same time. But there's an inclusion factor in that. Is the children and the offspring come, is the children and the offspring come from that? <laughs> from that. <laughs> there's joy in inclusion. There's, it doesn't matter if you're going through a mad season. It doesn't matter if you're going through a season where you're transitioning, even out of here. Whatever it is that you're going through, there's a chance to do what David did and, and include God into it. And no matter what you do, when you include God, even if there is pain and torment in what you're going through, it turns into joy because it's eternal. When Christ died, when he died for us, it wasn't just a matter of him dying because he loves us. He was taking our meltdowns. He was taking all of the junk and all of the stuff Whatever it is, no matter how ugly it looks to you, the end road is damnation for eternity. And you got saved from that. If you don't have joy from that, I don't want to tell you. Actually, I do. Include God. Just take communion right now. Include Him. And see the difference. Father, thank you for this moment to, to just love on you. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we've walked into, no matter what we put ourselves through, Father, thank you for this chance to let this be real, just as you are real. Father, as your pain is real, as your sacrifice is real, and eternity is real. God, we get heaven with you, Father. Moment to moment, and eternity with you. And it starts right here. Help us to embrace this moment and include you in this. In your holy name we pray. Part of Psalm 34, you have Bibles <clears throat> of David. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Inclusion together. I like that part. Oh, magnify the Lord. Hear that song. Amen. Oh, magnify the Lord. But I'm the only one. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, magnify the Lord. But then he says, with me. Magnify the Lord with me. And that's what we're doing right now. We're together. This is all about inclusion, family inclusion. Uh, it goes on. We talked about he turned that madness into joy. Now, Psalm 34, 4 through 7. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And delivered me from all my fears. That's a pretty big word shoved in there. All my fears. He let me go. As Janine says, this is not letting go. This is not letting go. This is letting go. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. 
and their faces shall never be ashamed. That's another big word, never. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. Are you hearing that? That's pretty big news. The angel of the Lord encamp around those who fear him. And God's talking about the fear, the reverence, and the love. The love he has for him. But when's the last time that you felt fear? The opposite of joy. You remember the last time that you felt fear? I bet you included God in that, no matter what it was. But so you're pretty quick to take him in on that one. There's a couple different types of fear as we get ready to take communion here. Uh, you can probably see where we're going with this, obviously. But a couple types of fear. There's practical fear. Um, imagine being on an Illinois farm. Uh, Tom can tell you about this. He's been out in the Midwest. And to see the Norman Rockwell like horizon. I was there. My friends, the Lovitz, uh, a great family. And uh, they had three little kids, four little kids. Uh, one hadn't been born yet. And Reese, who was eight at the time. So imagine sitting on an Illinois farm. You got this little eight year old Reese, this cool kid. And your, your parents, and you're standing back in the distance, just a little bit over the hill, and you see Reese tending to the horses. And then you see the little, little eight year old behind the horse here. And you see the horse here. And then you see the horse's leg come up and kick and hit Reese in the face and knock him you know, 15 feet away, knock him into a hospital. That's fear. Can you imagine? Now, Jim was talking about the fear of having a child. Just that fear of, oh, waking up, going to bed, I can't begin to have. We have an awesome protection. The angels of the Lord encamp themselves around those who fear him, those who love him. So we don't have to fear the horse's kick. You know, physically, yeah, God deeply, definitely wants to surround you and protect you from those fears. There's another type of very briefly, a supernatural kind of fear. Because if you believe, uh, if you believe Psalm 34, then that means you believe 2 Samuel 18, 13. You believe them all. And everything that's in this word, you can't just pick one little thing and, and throw it out that doesn't work for you. It talks about the supernatural. Angels and demons, it's real, believe it, and get in tune with it. Because the angels of the Lord are camping around you. That probably means there's a reason. There's something else trying to get in there, right? Okay. So in my days as a chaplain, I would stand, I sit at the bedside, and one woman is one of the first people I ever encountered. Um, as I was with her, and she was about to pass away, I had never met her, I just started there. She had never seen me, and uh, she was spouting off numbers, just numbers, numbers, just kept coming out. I don't know if she's counting, I don't remember. But um, uh, in the middle of it, she popped up, she squeezed my hand, she looked at me and said, Your father, you'll see him soon. And my father had just passed away. She said, your father, you'll see him soon. And it's really important not to look for things like this because that becomes the idol, that becomes the mechanism. Bob will tell you all about that. Just keep your focus on Christ. But those things happen because it's a supernatural world. And she says, your father, you'll see him soon. How soon? <laughs> I'm not going to judge. I literally walked down the hall looking at the chandeliers. I drove about five miles an hour home. There's, there's a real fear there because it's out of our control. Eternity can be out of our control. We're not going the right way. Because eternity in, in heaven is moment to moment with God. The Bible will tell you about uh, an instance in, in, in eternity and damnation that looks like this. A person with a spoon that has the food that they covet, lust after, crave, whatever it is. And it's right here. You just kind of can't quite get to it. And so they're just doing this for eternity while being mocked. In Revelation 9, it talks about five months. There are four, four of the supernatural spirits that get released into earth. And for five months, they torment, they torment, they torment. They're not allowed to hurt you, not allowed to kill you. For five months, all death stops. Cancer goes away, no death. It says it right here, and you better believe. So five months goes by, and you're not allowed to die. But you're tormented by these beasts. Tormented. Like they're trying to do right now, they're trying to get in here, but the angels camp around us and fear them. Tormented. What does that mean? Why would God allow that? That sounds like a loving Savior to me. A loving Savior who would let us be in torment with a beast that you can't even imagine for five months and you can't die? Because he's saying, that's only five months. You sure you don't want to, you sure you want to have eternity like that? Of damnation? Because it, when it comes to money, it's like kind of like the spoon, where you can imagine spending eternity with this money just coming out. You can never just, 
It's there. And it's within your grasp, but you can't get it. And your entire identity, your, your, your own idol, your entire identity is involved in all the people around you in the nation. What do they think of me? That sounds a lot like her. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. So therefore, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. That's not what God is saying. But there was this supernatural aspect of trying to get in and saying, right now, don't put that money in there. Don't. You, 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 I get it. You can trust God, but you can touch money. It's tangible. You can fix things with money. You can have more clout and power of money and spirals and spirals and spirals all the way to hell. I'm telling you the truth. Right now, whatever hesitancy you have, let it go. Because it leads to a downward spiral. Man. Whatever fear you're having, know that the angels of the Lord are camping around you. It's right here for your betterment. Your betterment is to give because it's not just about a rope ritual. This is worship. This is worship that leads to eternal worship. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to be afraid and to risk and to feel like we're getting hit by a force. God, when we give up the money that we're scared to give up. Father, get inside of our hearts. Is it because we're broke? Or is it because we want power? Or is it because of all the other eight million things that Satan and his pathetic army are trying to whittle into our brains and our hearts? To get in between our time and Father, clear this time up so that we can just give and have joy in you. Bless the families, bless the economics of this, of this church. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Um, you get a primer of what all of these curves are about. Lastly, uh, with the rain, with the wind, with the perpetual cold that we've had this winter, it is good that's why I don't talk about one of the seven things to be grateful for and praise God for. I just encourage you to do that because this is an easy time of the year, common time of the year, for people to be discouraged or just downright grumpy. Um, it is good for us, for our own mental health, for our own maturity, um, to keep a list, a running list of all the good things that we do. Because human nature is to be critical, to find fault either in ourselves or those around us. And it is good to get our mind at a more mature place and to be thinking the positive, see what we see good in people and what God gives to us and dogs or cats or a flower or whatever. <laughs> that's what runs through our mind. That's right. That's why that this is there. All right, let's, let's pray for the little ones. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you so very, very much again, Father, for poor more weather. The sun is Father, we thank you for worship. We thank you for calling. Father, we thank you for the things you serve and for Catherine and all the food together. And get the food, now get the food here, Father. We thank you for my get the food here. Father, we just thank you for all that goes on every single week in our school worship. Father, thank you. But we want to pray for the kiddos once again. That they would um, go through a church experience that would not just be about church and the attendance of a church and the rah-rah of the church, but Father, somehow it would run very, very deep and joyful. And they would get very rooted in it and become part of who they are, their character, personality, their desires. The church is a place to be. The church is life and a community of church. The worship of you, the focus upon you, and the significance of you, and how you are a part of everything. So, Father, please help our kiddos to grow up with that and to learn that and be very submitted to that. Father, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, that was your business. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to present a, a new praise song today, and uh, we're just going to present it in. in Form on the special music, I suppose, this morning, because it's new, it may or may not be familiar with it. It's got all kinds of different timing signatures and things, which makes it difficult to sing along with sometimes. Yeah, so why did I choose it? <laughs> I chose it because it's an important message that we all need to keep in mind, to be mindful of that sometimes things happen, the Lord gives us lessons for our own good. Sometimes they're not always the way we want it to be. And what Colin has talked about, the supernatural, I love how Jesus taught supernatural lessons in natural ways. He took the disciples out of the lake, and he knew there was going to be a storm. He knew that they were going to be scared to death, and he just watched them freak out. <laughs> and it's kind of a life lesson there. It's like through faith, he does all things, through his love, he does all things for our good. So that's what the song speaks about. The song is called, Your Love Never Fails. Would you stand up with just the better energy, I think? And sing along, we're going to have the words, we have the words on those? Okay.
Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see you. I apologize for not being here last week. I do want to thank Steve for the last moment. Uh, it was just one of those Sunday mornings where I got up and uh, it was better that I was at home than it was that I was here. And you would have been grateful that I was at home than here. So um, I have some sort of a bug that got a hold of me. But uh, thanks, Steve, for, for just stepping in on such late notice. Also, just want to acknowledge those that might be on the live uh, stream. We just appreciate you being a part of us on a Sunday morning. We do really want to connect with you, and uh, if there's any way we can come alongside of you or connect with you or have fellowship with you, uh, just reach out to us at 818-370-1096. That's my cell phone, and we'd love to be able to have that opportunity of fellowship and share life together. So since the first of the year, we've been talking about this thing we call prayer. And, and I'm I'm hoping and actually praying that we might begin to have a paradigm shift. I, I oftentimes feel like we, we look at prayer as, as kind of a, a, a spiritual thing, and it is, and, and, and kind of a theolog theolog theological thing, and it is, and a doctrinal thing, and it is. But if it, if it stays in that realm, if it stays in the realm of just something that we believe, but we don't really have the experience of that in a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I think we're missing the gift. And, and the paradigm, all that's to be said is that it's not so much about understanding the all, all the nuances of prayer, but it's much more about that paradigm change that I'm trying to share about, is that it's, it's this dialogue that we can have with the Creator. You know, if, if, if there's nothing else that we know about prayer, it's that the creator of the universe, that our Heavenly Father, wants to have this intimate dialogue, this intimate conversation with you. The, the problem is, is that most of the time, that dialogue and that conversation takes place in a boat that has waves coming, crashing in, and, and the storms, and the sails are being ripped like you saw in that picture. And that's when we really get down and say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this dialogue. Mm -hmm. But if, if that's the only time we experience this dialogue, this conversation, this, this shared life, we're, we're missing the gift that every moment of every day, every situation, every, every opportunity, we could be walking with God, having this, this conversation going on with Him, so that we don't miss the gift of what that moment might have. And that's what we've been talking about. And, and, and so, look, this is taking a whole lot longer than I thought it would. I, this was really supposed to be just like a two-weeker, and now it's been about four weeks. But when we pray, we, 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 we pray to God, we have this conversation, we have these expectations, if you will. And, but the first expectation 
expectation you got to know and got to have is that, that God's there. He's not just there in the storm. He's not just there in, 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 in uh, the times that you think about it, but he's always there. Every moment of every day, he's there. But the question then that we talked about is, the question is, am I there with him? The second expectation we have is that not only is he there, but he cares and he's listening to you. <laughs> that, that he's actually desiring to have shared life with you. That he wants nothing more than to be able to be in the moment with you so that you can be in the moment with him. That's really the essence, I believe, of prayer. It, it's this, this connection that we can have with all the creator, with the creator of the universe. And then we talked about the week before I got sick that, that we have some expectations that God will answer our prayer, but we've got to understand that there's some things that need to be going on in this conversation so that he's going to give us his best. And, and the first expectation is that, that my prayer, or the, end, the, first, the third expectation is that he'll answer my prayer, but if there's a barrier in him answering it, it could be my sin. It could be that it's, it's mainly, I'm on my throne, I'm in that place where I really don't care as much about what he desires as I care about what I want him to desire for me. See, most of our prayers, really, when you stop to think about it, have very little to do with God. What is it that you want in this moment? But has everything to do with, but God, here's what I want in this moment. And if I'm on the throne, if, I, if I'm, I'm calling the shots, if, if it's all about God, bring my kingdom into being. That's, we have the, the sin that becomes a barrier because God loves me too much to answer that prayer. God loves me too much to answer the prayer of me being on the throne of my life. The second thing is that, if, that might be a barrier is if I'm praying and, and what I'm asking for isn't lining up with God's perfect will. And that's hard because we think, you know, God, how can this not be your perfect will? It's my perfect will and I know that I've got a perfect will. How come you're not on that page? Don't you understand how this is working out? And, and so the second thing I need to be willing to, to understand is that if, if God's going to answer the prayer that I have when it lines up with his will, and I've got to trust that his will is better than my will. And that leads us to the point this morning that I'd like to speak, take a, a few moments on. And that is, are we really praying, believing that something's going to are we praying in faith? I've been doing some study on that, reading on stuff that. I was reading this one book about the prayer, the, you know, how to pray in faith, and, and, and it really was giving me all these formulas. You know, if you just, you know, if you just say this, and you, you know, you apply this passage, and you, and, and, I, and as I was reading, I almost felt like, so this is how I'm going to kind of like blackmail God into answering this prayer. You know, if I do all this right, you know, God's going to have to answer it because that's when, I, you know, I've just done the right formula. I don't think that's what praying in faith is about. Praying in faith is, is, is the, the, really the foundation of our relationship with him is our faith. But faith is one of those, it's a hard thing to describe, I think. I, I wrestle with how do you, how do we get a hold of this reality, this truth, this 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 thing we call faith? And, and, and you know, a lot of people think we're kind of crazy because we believe in this creator of the universe, and, and, and it's like, well, that's just a big blind leap. You know, you just stepped off the edge of a cliff because you believe in this God, this creator, this 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 entity out there. And, and I, I, what do you have? What what would cause you to want to believe in that? But God tells us in Romans, through Paul, in Romans 1.18, that this is what really takes God off. You know, we love to talk about God's love, don't we? I do. I love to talk about his forgiveness. I love to talk about his grace. Do you know what I'm not so good about talking about? <coughs> God gets angry. God gets really upset. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from 
from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. If I understand that right, God says that there is there is something inside every person. And one one author, and I can't remember who it was, but one author said, This is that God-shaped hole in everyone's life. Another author said that it is it is that um, just I don't <laughs> see your moment when I ran out the door. But it was it's this God-shaped hole, it's it's the, path, the, the, the scripture that talks about an eternity has been placed in every person. There's this, this, we have been created in the image of God, if you will. And so that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes of the eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. You see, nobody's going to go up there and go before the creator of the universe and go, yeah, I'm just so sorry I missed it. <laughs> you know, my bad. <laughs> I, but you know what? No, I, I, didn't have any, I didn't have any evidence of it. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to take that blind leap. And, and, and what I understand Paul's saying here in Romans is that all we have to do is open up our eyes and everywhere you look, everywhere you look, you see design. Everything is design. You can't take that flower out there without looking at that flower and seeing the design of the flower. You think about your human body and just the, 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 the miracle, the, the, the manifest miracle that your body is because everything inside your body has design. And so I think if, if I was going to paraphrase this, and heaven forbid I paraphrase um, scripture, but what came to my mind in this is that God's basically saying, look, you think it might be stupid to believe in a creator of the universe, but it's even you're, you're even more ignorant and stupid if you believe that everything you see is accidental. Amen. That everything you see, it was a big, so, and, and not just one accident, we, we, we've got like 30 accidents right in here. Every one of you that has fingerprints that are unique to your own. And that you have unique fingerprints that nobody else has. That, that was by accident. The, 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 your personality, the way you think, the way that you respond, the way that you feel, everything. That's all accident. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're not an accident. You're been that creator. By the, you have been a creation by the creator of the universe, and he says there's no excuse because all you've got to do is stop and really think about it and recognize that if there wasn't a God, there's no way in the world that this could be just an accident. And, and so, faith is understanding that there is the creator of the universe that he exists, and that he's there. And Hebrews 11, 6, it says, without faith it's impossible to please God. For whoever does not would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. So that when we're having this conversation that, yes, God is there, but it's more than the fact that God is there, that God is God. That, that he wants that our best for us. And so in order for us to know that his best is what's best for us. We need to be in relationship with him and seeking him and, and, and diving into understanding what his best is. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 21. And we're going to look at knowing that God exists, knowing that, that faith is all about me taking the evidence, and that's really what I was trying to share, the evidence that he exists and, and turning that into a belief so that then I will have faith and act upon that faith. And that's what Jesus does here in Matthew 21. Starting in verse 18, in Matthew 21, in the morning, he was returning to the city, he became hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it, but only leaves. And he said, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. It sounds like he was kind of snarky, wasn't he? When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, 
how did the fig tree wither at once? There it is. Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith, if you take what you believe, turn that into a trust, into to an action, then I'm going to be able to do more than you could ever think. He says, if you don't, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what, what has been done to the fig tree, but you may even say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. It will happen. And what if you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. You see the connection between what we're having this dialogue with God and this idea of believing that he's hearing, believing that he's acting, believing that he's a part of it, believing that he wants to have this occur. But all of that, it, it's not in, the, in, this, it, it's not in the, the vacuum of not understanding that ultimately it's what is it that we want, that, that God wants to occur in the midst of what I'm praying. If you ask in prayer, you'll receive it if you have faith. Faith that God exists. Faith that God's plan and purpose is better than yours. Faith that he has an answer that's better than your prayer request. Faith that says God's going to do what he needs, uh, what he desires to be done if we only trust in him. That's what faith is. Faith is taken and saying, I don't see it, but I believe it that you're going to have a better answer to this, or my answer, or, or what I'm praying is the right answer, but I'm going to leave it up to you because you're God. Matthew 7, 7 through 11 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. What man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will not give him a snake will he? If then you're being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father who is in heaven will give what is good to those who ask of him? The problem is, is for me, the problem is, I think what I'm asking it's what's best. But the question isn't what I'm asking is best, so now God <laughs> give it to me. The question is, do I believe that God is ultimately pure good and love? And that whatever his desire in the midst of my request is ultimately what's going to be best for my life. And that's why when we ask we ask in his name. We think, God, you know better than I do right now, so in your name, I'm going to believe that I am going to pray and have this discussion with you and this dialogue with you so that you might answer the way that is in your perfect will. <clears throat> John 14, 12 says, Truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall be he also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to God. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified to the Son. In the Son. So why do we, you know, why do we do that, that postscript thing in Jesus' name? You know? Well, why do we do that? Well, is that just something that we've been taught? Is that just something we're supposed to do? Because if we don't do that, God says, oh, sorry, just, uh, you know, that if you would have said my name, I would have been able to do that, but... No, what we're thinking, that's the faith part. It's like, man, in your name, I know that, that what's the name represent? The name represents everything that is, that, that is connected to that person's uh, life and, and resources, if you will. My, my, my name allows me to have a checking account that I can write my name, and I have access to everything in that checking account based on my name. Does that make sense? When you, when you think about it, in Jesus' name, what you're saying is that I believe what Paul said in Ephesians, that all the, all the blessings of all eternity are available to me, or are, are, are an option to me. And, and in your name, I know that you're going to provide those blessings, you're going to provide your perfect will, you're going to provide those answers to those prayers in your name, because I want your will, and I want you to be able to have your kingdom come to this earth, 
so that people might know you and understand you and see you. In Jesus' name, name means the prayer is offered in faith that Jesus is trustworthy, therefore worthy of positions and authority he holds over us. But for this to happen, we have to be connected to God in such a, an intimate way. John, John writes for us what Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown into away as branches are dry up. Gather them, cast out into the fire, and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So, Prove to be my disciples. When we pray, when we have this conversation, when we have this dialogue with the Creator, have we spent much time abiding in the midst of that? Or are we kind of this branch out here that goes, oh, hey, fine. Uh, by the way, I need such and such, such and such, such and such, such and such. Okay, great. I wonder if many of my prayers aren't answered in the way that I seek, answered in the way that I desire, or that I don't even think God is listening. I wonder if many times it's because I'm not praying connected to the vine. See, if I was praying connected with the vine, then I would be listening to him about what I'm talking to him about so that I might know what his perfect will is. I might know what his desires are. I might understand it from his perspective. Heavenly Father, why the storm? Why the tragedy? Why, why, why the challenge? And that song said, because he works good. Well, what's the good that he wants to work? He wants to work the good of me becoming more like his son. And oftentimes, the only way that I can get to be more like his son is to go through challenges and trials and, and, and the difficult refining fire moments. And so, I hope this is making sense that the, the prayer of faith is believing that you are a branch that is connected to the vine. And the prayer of faith says, God, in the midst of you sharing with me, what is the fruit you want to develop out of this conversation? But it's his fruit, not my fruit. It's what he wants to occur, not what I want to occur. It's ultimately saying, God, how do you? You want me to be a part of what you're doing on this earth so that I might know your best. A prayer of faith, I believe, is taking what you believe, taking that belief, and, 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 and making a, a decision about it, which is called faith, and then based on that faith, you then have action. If you look at the book of Hebrews, by faith, all those heroes of the faith, what did they do? They had a conversation with God, they listened to God, they heard God, and then they obeyed God. What was the faith? The faith was the obedience, because oftentimes they were obeying in a, in a vacuum. Abraham, take your family and go. Yeah, where are we going? Oh, you know, just take your family and go. Noah, I want you to build an ark. By faith, Noah built an ark. And this rain's going to come. What's rain? Well, don't worry about it. You'll find out later. But you're going to be glad that you have this boat. See, they took a belief, knowing that the creator of the universe was telling them to take their what they believe and put it into action, which is faith, build a boat so that they might be faith, they might be saved. All this to be said is that when we pray, is the destination that you have that your prayer is answered the way you want it answered? Or when do we pray in faith that God loves me enough that he'll help me understand what his answer is and in faith it'll be his best and I can join him in the journey of maybe helping to be a part of the answer to that prayer. Father, I have to confess with, with my brothers and sisters that I'm still, I'm still a child 
when it comes to understanding this idea of this conversation with you. I'm still a child and I'm trying to understand how you want us to have this dialogue with you. And, and you, you seek us asking, Father. You, you seek us having requests and petitions and supplications. You want us to talk with you, Father. But help me to have that paradigm changed, Father God, that it's more about what you want to occur than it is about what I want to occur. Because you know better than I do. Because you're God. Help me to change the way I have a conversation with you so that I might be a part of the vine. So that you can produce the fruit through my prayers that you would desire so that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on this earth just like it is in heaven. And we ask this in your son's powerful and holy name. Amen. Mm -hmm. God bless you.